to make the introduction brief. Brother is here to impart some knowledge upon us. Everyone knows who he is, Brother Khalid Abdul Muhammad, the truth terrorist, the knowledge gangster, the lie killer, the urban gorilla, the black history hitman. Brothers and sisters, put your hands together and give a warm welcome, a black hand to Brother Khalid Abdul Muhammad. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. We forever thank Almighty God, Allah, for coming as it was written and prophesied that he would come to seek and to save that which was lost. We thank him for coming in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and raising up in our midst a divine leader, a divine teacher, and a divine guide in the person of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I thank the two of them for the man who is my mentor and my teacher and who is largely responsible for my spiritual rites of passage. I speak of none other than my spiritual father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In their names, I greet you, my sisters and brothers, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Hotel. Shalom, shalom. Shalafiani. Radigani. And free the land and black laws for all black people. It is indeed my honor to be invited again to D&J Book Distributors here in New York and to <laughs> have this opportunity to speak to you on this very timely topic. I don't know who really chose the topic. I don't know if it was chosen here or if Brother Kareem chose it or Brother Salim chose it. Okay, and it's a very good topic, I believe, and hopefully we can cover this ground and get out relatively quickly. The subject is dealing with spiritualism and religion. Actually, it pits the two against each other. Religion versus spirituality in the black community. That's quite a subject. Some might ask the question, what's the difference between religion and spirituality? Why do we have to make a distinction? Well, as we study our ancient history, we will find that the African man, the African woman, the original black man and woman of the planet Earth, that we are a spiritual people by nature. No matter where you find us, you'll find us a spiritual people. That's why they say of the most low down and no good and low lifed ones after 400 years under the white man but can be redeemed, those among us, no matter what kind of filth they're in, they say no matter what you find them doing, that there is something spiritual about the most low life among us. Robbers, rapers, killers, dope dealers. It is said, especially by our elders, they say if you catch him in the right position, which is really, in most cases, the wrong position, and catch him really down, you'll find that he's going to call on God. In all of that madness and all of that filth, there's something in the black man, something in the black woman that is spiritual by nature. Now whence came this thing called religion? Religion coming from an etymological re root, relink, or to bind together, or to relink, or reconnect. Well, in all actuality and truth, 
as I was taught by my teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who was taught by his teacher, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, is that we have never really been fully disconnected from that spirituality. When you study the pineal gland, when you study the highly developed melanocytes and the melanin in the black man and woman, and my guess who I was looking for, Sister Alake just walked in. Good example of melanin since I'm talking about it. Study melanin and study the pineal gland. Then you understand our spiritual connection to the God, to the universe, and to the cosmos. And we understand that white people, not having that development of melanin, and not having the highly developed pineal gland. Actually, they teach in Western medicine that the pineal gland has no function whatsoever, that it's just there, it has no purpose. Now we know God makes nothing that has no purpose. Certainly, we know that God makes nothing that has no purpose in this magnificent form called the human form or the human body, everything in this magnificent human form has an aim and a purpose. But the reason they say that the pineal gland has no function or purpose is because now as we study, we are finding out that a great percentage of white people, a high percentage, sometimes 75, sometimes 80, sometimes 85% or more, we are finding that their pineal gland is what is called in uh, traditional medicine as has been studied by the greats among us as black people that their pineal gland is what is called calcified. And so with a calcified pineal gland, then they don't have the connection in the cosmos. They don't have the root in the universe. They don't have the connection to the almighty, all-wise God and creator. And we find also that for every physical law, there's a mental and a spiritual counterpart. Everything in nature enjoys the sun, bathes in the sun, basks in the sun. The sun gives light, life, and energy to everything in the universe. Some flowers turn with the sun. Whichever direction the sun is in, you'll find the plant leaning in that direction, turning in that direction. Everything absorbs the rays of the sun, the life-giving rays of the sun. But the white man finds that the sun is an enemy to his and her existence. And so now they not only have copper tone and man tan and all of the other sun blockers, they call it. You know what I'm talking about. They have to wear the sun blockers. Gee whiz. Got to have sun blockers because the sun is an enemy to them. And they end up with what is called melanoma. And melanoma striking white people, setting up a cancerous state that eats away at the very fabric and fiber of their flesh, destroying them. And we find them now taking some kind of... Um, Melanin peel. What do they call that stuff they got out there? Melatonin. I knew you knew. <laughs> this is that D and J crew. <laughs> and some of you make all the stops all over all of the boroughs. Can you imagine the devil trying to do it the artificial way? That's like baking a cake. You put all the ingredients in the cake, but you leave the baking soda out, the baking powder out. And you put the cake in the oven and it falls. Then you're going to go like a fool and take the cake out the oven and try to sprinkle some baking soda, baking powder, some baking powder really, baking powder on top of the cake after the cake has been baked and after the cake is already flat in the pan and then put it back in the oven as though now it's going to rise because you have baking powder on top of the cake. The baking powder must be an integral ingredient in the mixture and the ingredients of the recipe of the cake before it's put in the oven to bake if the cake is going to look right, taste right, and stand up and not fall down. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all don't know nothing about baking no cake. You just know how to eat the cake. That's all. 
and I'm probably one of those. <laughs> but I know about this cracker, though. <laughs> I know about this cracker, though. Can't bake no cake. But I know how to work on this cracker falling, <laughs> like the cake with no baking powder in the oven. So melatonin, trying to take it after you have come into existence, after your nature has been determined, after you have been coded, now you're going to sprinkle some melatonin somewhere, and it's going to give you what the black man has by nature. It's going to give you what the black woman has by nature. A group of scholars, including Dr. Wade Nobles and others out of the San Francisco and the Bay Area, did a recent study to show that black people are more spiritually inclined than white people. It shows that black people, I repeat, are more spiritually inclined than white people. This study gives us the key to the devious, concupiscent nature of white people. Their natural leaning against the divine and universal order. Whatever any book says, Old Testament, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, no, I don't care what it is. Uh, uh, if it's uh, the Quran, if it's the Bible, Old or New Testament, as I said, whatever the divine word says, you'll find white people saying, oh, it's all right. Try it. You'll like it. They go against God's law and against God's word and against God's way. They are the only people that pollute the very air that even they have to breathe, pollute the very water that even they have to drink, which is condemning themselves to death, destroying the rainforest, tampering with the delicate balance in nature, destroying the ozone layer around the earth. And so now it's hot when it's supposed to be cold. It's cold when it's supposed to be hot. It's snowing when the sun is supposed to be shining. And the sun is shining when it's supposed to be snowing. Everything all messed up now. The birds, the bees, the trees, the flowers, the ants, everything crying out for relief from the rule of the white man. Everybody on the face of the planet Earth except Uncle Mose and Aunt Jemima. Uncle Mose and Aunt Jemima, here in the hells of North America, we're still trying to integrate with the Grim Reaper, the white man himself. Still trying to marry the white man. Our magazines, Ebony and Jet, and our newspapers still glorify Negroes who marry crackers. It's a big deal if you marry a peckerwood. It's news if you marry a cracker. It's news because a white person has accepted you. So black people are happy when white folks accept us. I want the religion or the state of spiritual consciousness that God has in the triple blackness of the universe when he first set it all in motion. That's the religion I want. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. And since we know that God is not the author of confusion, whence came the confusion? The confusion came from the devil. The confusion comes from the white man. Over 666 different denominations of Christianity over 300 and something different denominations of Islam. And in New York City, you got a different religion in several in, on every corner and several more in the middle of the block. <laughs> Some of you have heard me say before, Church of God in Christ on the corner. Church of God out of Christ right next door. Church of God over Christ across the street. Church of God around Christ around the corner. Church of God, in Christ, out of Christ, over Christ, under Christ, around Christ. Some just, Church of God ain't got no Christ. Some of them, Church of Christ, ain't got no God. Some of them just having church, ain't got no God, ain't got no Christ, just having church. Got the damn organ going and the piano going and a whole lot of hell. Sissies running all over the place with choir robes on. Hallelujah! 
Hallelujah. And the preacher is a sissy holding the Bible funny. This is not all the churches. I repeat, this is not all. But it covers many of them. The pastor bringing two men up to the pulpit, to the altar of God, where God's name is honored and revered, to marry two men in the house of God. Marry two women in the house of God, which is an abomination before God. And so the church has played the role of a whore. The Bible asks the question of the, it asks the question of would, whether the, the bride would be ready and if her garments would be white when the bridegroom appears, representing the coming of the Messiah, who is the representative of God among the people on this plane on earth. And so symbolically and metaphorically, they call the church the, the bride. And they ask if the church would remain a virgin and if the church's garments would be unsoiled, if the garments of the church would be pure and white, they say pure and white, meaning would the garments show any spots or blemishes? But now the church is laying down in the filth and wallowing in the filth of the world. Some preachers sell the vote of their congregation to no good crackers like Bill Clinton, uh, Buchanan, uh, the cracker with the big ears, uh, Perot, lying devil. You know the cracker got a billion dollars, he had to be lying. And his nose didn't grow like Pinocchio, this cracker's ears grow. Still a sign that he's lying. All of these crackers lying. You heard what happened over in New Jersey. The preachers that were called on the carpet for selling votes and influencing the black voting constituent, you say, well, we don't know whether that's true or not. I say, don't even be in a position to be accused of that. Be so above that until nobody would even think that you might have done it. But you know how many remember the big scandal when they were talking about the preachers over in New Jersey that were selling votes or on the take? Yeah, around that Christine Whitman. They call her Whitman, but it's really white man. It's, it's real quick, Christine Whitman. It's white man. That's, a, you know, well, that's another story for another time. The church has played the harlot, as the Bible says. The religion that I want is the religion, I repeat, that God had. The spiritual consciousness, if you will, that God had from the very beginning of it all in the triple blackness of space and the universe. I want the religion that the birds have, that the bees have, that the ants have. They have a natural religion. The birds have a natural religion. They obey the will of God. They bow in submission to the natural, universal, and divine order that God has set up. And so the birds prosper. No homeless birds. All the birds got a house. May not be one of them little funny houses you build or I build for them in a tree, but they got a house. Birds have a nest. Birds have food. They don't have no mission for the birds. The birds got to go and fly by in a line and wait for a handout for some crackers at the Salvation Army singing some foolishness and putting some foolishness in their heads to get a meal. Birds have food. Birds have ample covering for the change in the season. Birds. Birds. I want the religion that the birds have. What is the religion of the ant? The ant builds a society, if we can use that term, an ant society, metaphorically speaking. Ants work in unity, work for the common good of the whole, work in season and know what to do out of season because there's work to do out of season, but another kind of work to be done in the season of the greater work for the greater good of the ant colony. I wonder, what is the religion of the ant? Look at the bees. Bees don't go to a recipe or cooking school home economic school and get a recipe on how to make honey? Hell, they just make honey. They don't go and learn at a carpentry school 
and learn how to build a hive, there's something in the nature of the bird, something in the nature of the bee, something in the nature of the ant. I wonder, what is the religion of the bird, of the ant, of the bee? You say, we're not birds, we're not bees, we're not ants, but there's something in our nature even greater than the bird, than the bee, and the ant that is supposed to incline us to that which is divine. But we have not been under our father, our spiritual father. We have not been under our spiritual mother. We have been under a surrogate parent who is the devil himself. And he has taught us the ways of himself. And so our society is like the white man's society. We have put down our culture and picked up the white man's culture. His holidays are our holidays. His drinks are our drinks. His drugs are our drugs. His madness is our madness. His foolishness is our foolishness. We watch his soap operas. We watch the madness that he puts on his screen to put into our heads and our hearts and then we go and try that same mess on each other. And his world is falling down so ours certainly can't come up and be sustained if we're watching played right out before our eyes the fall of the white man's world and trying to live it ourselves. Prayer is important to a spiritual people. When you're spiritual, you're prayerful. It makes no difference what your religion is. Re remember, it makes no difference. In a few minutes, I'll show you that all of the religions, and I'm not going to be long, all of the religions come from the original black man and black woman. Some of them, a spin has been put on it, a twist has been put on it, something added in or taken out. But the white man didn't have religion. He crawled around on his all fours in the caves and hills of Europe, eating juniper roots and eating each other with no religion, afraid of fire, Hadn't even discovered it for the most part. Had no house with a window, didn't know what a shoe was, and didn't even know what clothes was. Walked around butt naked, hot or cold, every day. Intercourse with the animals. You can't argue with him when he say the dog is his best friend. <laughs> you can't come between him and the dog. Have to put a law on the books to keep him off of the sheep. I don't know what it is with the white man and the sheep, but they got a law in the penal code book to keep crackers off a sheep. I guess he just liked to hear the sheep go, bad, <laughs> bad. <laughs> you got to protect sheep from a so-called man. Prayer, regardless to the religion, let us attempt to give prayer some clear definition. Prayer is focus, meditation, concentration, communion and communication with the almighty, all wise God and creator, the great power and force behind it all. Prayer is focus, meditation, concentration, communion, and communication. That's what prayer is. Prayer pulls on the cosmos. Prayer rearranges the universe. Prayer affects the molecules and the atoms of the atmosphere. If you realize the power of your mind and the power of the spoken word coming from you, they say, in the beginning was the word. Well, it is that word in your head, in your heart, and released from your lips in the beginning that rearranges the molecules and the atoms of the atmosphere and pulls on the universe to shape the reality that you have spoken, to shape the reality that you have willed by planting the thought firmly in the universe. That's what prayer is. It ain't nothing spooky. Spookism is an intense emotional commitment to a non-existent nothing. That's all spookism is. It's believing in 
Shazam, abracadabra, some hocus pocus. When the power is in you all the time. The same God that set the universe in motion, spirituality, guides us and teaches us that that power is in you and in me. All religion coming up out of the root, which is spirituality. Spirituality is the root, is the African root or the original root of the black man and woman that religion, the perversion called religion, has grown up from and grown up out of. Religion divides us. We get hung up on labels. Huh? Winos don't have that much problem. Yeah, why not don't give a damn about the label? Why not just want to know what's in the bottle? What's the content? Give me the content, you keep the label. We get hung up on the label, not realizing that many times the content is essentially the same. And we fall out with each other over the label. Oh, you one of them Muslims. Oh, you, you one of them Muslims. Oh, you one of them crazy Christians. Oh, you one of them, you, 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 you off into that, that, that hoodoo, and voodoo, and that juju. Oh, you off into that doo-doo. Some real silly stuff. It makes no difference what label we put on it. What is the content? Let me cover that for a few minutes. In the ancient Kemetic system, which is called the Egyptian system by the white man, the Greek, the free, but the true name is Kemet. In the ancient Kemetic system, we have what is called the Netter system. What is it called? The Netter system. When you deal with Netters, you're dealing with the forces of nature. The white man gets the term Netter from nature, the forces of nature. And so to a fool, a fool would say, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient people of Kemet, they believed in many gods. They believed in Ptah, Amin, Amin-Ra, Aten, Nut, Mayat. They go on and on to say we believe in many gods. But that's not true. The name of each one of the so-called gods, terminology of the white man, represent different manifestations of the same one God. But a Christian trained by the white man, and all most Christians are trained by the white man, a Muslim trained by the white man, the white Arab, and most Muslims are trained by the white Arab, directly or indirectly, will criticize the ancient Africans of Kemet and say that this is a heathen religion. You got many gods. What's all that Amin and Amin-Ra and what's all that old talk about Ptah and what's all that old talk about this one and now all them different gods y'all got. And you got their pictures all up on the walls and stuff. Christian will criticize. Muslim will criticize. Well, look at it. Mr. Muslim? Miss Muslim, suppose the world criticized you. You talk about Al-Rahman. You talk about Al-Rahim. You talk about Al-Hakim. You talk about Al-Mumit. You talk about Al-Alim. You talk about 99 different attributes. And one who is unwise would believe that you have 99 different gods but it's really 99 different expressions and manifestations of the same one God and the 100th attribute is Allah, which means all in all, which pulls all 99 of the attributes together. Then we go and study the Ephah, the word, the Ephah, or we study the Akan, or we study the Yoruba. And when we study the Ifa, the word, or when we study the Akan or the Yoruba, and we read not from Bible or from Quran, but we read to find which Odu substantiates our position. The scripture, the text is called the Odu scripture or the Odu text. And when we study the Odu or the Odu text or scripture for substantiation and validation, we study and then we find we study about Orun in the heavenly abode. 
We study about Olurun, uh, the pure energy source of all things known and unknown. Ileda, energy and unconditional matter. Or we study about Oludumare, who is supposed to be the supreme Oludumare. Or we study about Orumila. And when we study about Orumila, we're talking about the witness of creation and the choice of destiny, or Esu, at the crossroads, or the divine messenger. Let's come back to Christianity. You talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. What about the 12 disciples? Each one of the disciples has a name, and each one of the disciples' name means something. Andrew, Bartholomew, John, huh? Judas, Peter. Peter coming from the etymological root, Petros, which means rock. They call him Simon Peter. How many know a little Bible? Let me see your hand. How many know of Simon Peter? You heard of Simon Peter? Yeah. Simon Peter. Simon represents faith. Peter represents rock. The name Simon Peter represents rock faith. Each of the 12 disciples of Jesus represents one of the 12 disciplines of the mind. One of the 12 attributes of the human being's psychic and spiritual makeup. Every one of the disciples represents, again, your divine mind, represents your divine makeup, represents the disciplines of the mind, the attributes of the mind, the divine qualities of the mind. Each of the 12 disciples represent your 12-fold divine power. That's all I mean. So if you look at it, each one of the so-called religions, when you get past the branch knowledge, go down the trunk of the tree of supreme wisdom to the root or the seed, you'll find that spirituality is at the root of it, is the seed of it, is what nurtures it, is what nurtures and nourishes it and gives it its, gives it its being and its existence. But all of the religions try to criticize each other when each has something that is being misunderstood by the other. And I'm here to tell you that there would be no Islam, there would be no Christianity, there would be no Judaism, there would be none of the world's major religions, no Catholicism, no Church of God in Christ, no Jehovah's Witness, none of them, no Seventh-day Adventist, if it were not for the original black man and woman of Africa. All of the world's religions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, all of them come from the spirituality of the black man and the black woman. Then you study about the chakras, how the chakras are, what, their con what the chakras connection is to divine and spiritual power. Whatever so-called religion you go to, there are spiritual principles operating. And those spiritual principles point all the way back to our forefathers and foremothers in the very beginning of it all. You call God the Most High. Now some of us get that mixed up. We need to stop and look at that for a minute. Doesn't mean that he's drunker than anybody else. Doesn't mean that he had more dope than anybody else. More drugs, so they call him the Most High. You know, that God is higher. You know what I'm saying? higher than everybody else. That's not what he's talking about. He's not the most high that way. Most high dealing with a certain elevation and exaltation. And when we study scripture, let's say scripture of Bible, you remember that Jesus told his disciples greater works would they do than he had done. Anybody know that from the scripture? Some of you know that. He said, the, the script, in the scripture, God points out that he would give the people power. Another scripture says, let this same mind that is in Christ Jesus be also in you. And then greater works in another place will you do than I have done. 
The church is a fool. Praising Jesus, but Jesus told them before he even left, greater works will you do. Greater than I have done. So Jesus had a work of feeding the multitudes, feeding the masses. If we have spirituality, then we should have the power, power and should be exhibiting the power of feeding the multitudes, feeding the masses. Jesus raised the dead. We should have the power to raise the mentally and spiritually dead. Not only that, Jesus walked the water. Now, we are taught that walking the water means water in scripture represents people, multitudes of people. That Jesus traveled on a high mental and spiritual plane above the people. We should have that kind of life. We should be living and exemplifying that kind of life. Spirituality is our very nature. It emanates from our, the very core of our being. Religion we have picked up from our enemy. There was no house of prayer prior to the coming of the white man. We didn't go in some house and pray. Be it called church, synagogue, mosque, masjid, temple. The whole earth was that great house of prayer with no roof with no roof on top of it. We didn't have to go and hide and pray for fear that some savage would run in and disrupt our prayers, and they do it now in the church. They rob the church. Come right in the church and stick the church up. Take all the collection money like it's a bank or a liquor store. But these buildings were built and more and more upon the coming of the white man. Our every heart beat, our pulse beat, our breath, our every breath as we breathed, we at a time were more in harmony with the universe, more in harmony with the God of our ancestors. It was a worship. Our lives were a worship. Now we have to go into a special place and worship because we don't do a worship every day. I repeat, our lives should be a worship to the Creator every day. Every day. But we had to go into a superficial, artificial thing because a superficial, artificial man, and I'm almost finished, came onto our planet with such a rebellious nature until then we had to come up with books, scripture, for guidance. What do you think we were doing before there was a Holy Quran, Muslims? Holy Quran ain't but 1,400 years old. You think we had to wait until 1,400 years old? We're the people with no birth record. Nobody can find the birth record of the original black man and the original black woman. You think we waited until 1,400 years ago for a book to come through uh, Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, as a revelation? We didn't even live until Prophet Muhammad was born? Give me a break, because if you study Bilal, the black Ethiopian or Abyssinian slave who was the slave of the white Arabs, when Prophet Muhammad raised up Islam and received the revelation, Bilal, the blue, black, purple, black African who had been brought in with the other slaves among Prophet Muhammad's people had never met Prophet Muhammad, never spoke to Prophet Muhammad, never heard his teaching. And Bilal believed in the one God already. And he met no prophet Muhammad. Where did it come from? It came up out of his genetic memory bank. He knew about the one God and had never met prophet Muhammad. Huh? What about the Akhenaten and the dynasty of Akhenaten? Well, Akhenaten turned up the light. He didn't begin it. He didn't start it. Akhenaten in ancient Egypt or Kemet tried to turn up the flame or the belief in one God. Right? And it was a reminder, but all the time his people were believing in one God to begin with. Whether it was Amen or Aten, it was still different manifestations of the one God. I'm trying to give you these principles. I know y'all used to be cussing out white folks and talking about let's go and kill all the crackers and kill a few niggas with the crackers. 
And, uh, but they gave me the subject. I had to speak on the subject they gave me. They gave me the subject, religion versus spirituality. And I think it's good uh, for us to be clear on some of these points. If you get your religion and your spirituality straight, you, you'll know who the enemy is. We can kill the cracker inside of self. And when it's time, kill the cracker outside of self. But we have to have the spirituality correct. And we have to be rooted and our foundation must be good. I've covered key points. I can let some of this go and maybe take a few questions and answers. In Islam, they believe in what is called that the spiritual house in Islam is called the what? Where all Muslims make their prayers, they face what place? What house? Well, not really east. The Kaaba. Let me say something that might shock everybody. All Muslims do not face the east for prayer. The majority of the Islamic world does not face east for prayer. I'm going to let it hang for a minute. And then you'll say, when I say it, you'll say, oh, I see. The spiritual center is called the Kaaba. But when you're talking about a spiritual center in Arabic, it's called the Qibla. The Qibla means spiritual center. And the actual spiritual center, the actual Qibla, is the Kaaba. The only ones who face the east are the ones who live in the west. So they look toward the east. What about the ones who already live in the east and still got to face the same house, Kaaba, they have to face west. Those who live in the north have to face south because it's a spiritual center. Those in the south have to face north because no matter whether they're in the north, south, east, or west, they're not facing a direction. They're facing a spiritual center. And that spiritual center is determined by where they are and their position on the planet. Everybody with me now? We just say it to the east because we're here in the west. And our, that's, that's, our, that's our reality, facing the east. But some Muslims face east, some face west, some face north, some face south, depending on the center of where the Kaaba is. But it's called the Kaaba. If we go back to the Medunetel, if we study in ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt, we will find that there is what is called the Ka and the Ba. And the Ka and the Ba represents the spirit and the what? The spirit and the soul. The Ka and the Ba, the spirit and the soul. Ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, studying the Medunetel. So the Arabs, have what is called the Kaaba. They put the Ka and the Ba together and they call the house that we face with a black veil over it, they call it Al Bayt Allah. And Al Bayt Allah means the house of God. The house of God. But is it really the house of God? Is it really God's address? Is that where God really lives? The church says God lives in the church. Does God really live in the church? The masjid, the mosque, the temple, the cathedral, the synagogue, they all say that God lives there. The question is, does God really live there? Is that the real house of God? I'll bait Allah. The church, the this, the that, the temple. Jesus in the scripture says, know ye not that you are the temple of of the living God. You are the temple of the living God. Not some house made of mortar and bricks and stone, no matter how pure your gold is, no matter how much fine marble or stone that you have put into it, no matter how many rubies and diamonds you have worked into the fiber and fabric of the wall, the real house of God is the very house that you have right now sitting in these seats some of you standing in this room you are the house of God you are the church of God 
You are the synagogue. We, the synagogue, the cathedral, the temple of the living God. And so that's why our ancient ancestors called it the Ka and the Ba, the spirit and the soul. And somebody came after them and put a spin on it, the white Arabs, and called their house of prayer the Kaaba. Oh, it's all right. It's, it, it helps orientate us back to ourselves. This is not to knock the Kaaba. I'm just telling you that there's a Kaaba above the Kaaba. And that you are the Kaaba that is above the Kaaba. You are the house that's above the house. If you ain't right, the church ain't right. If you ain't right, the temple ain't right. The mosque ain't right. The masjid ain't right. The synagogue ain't right. None of it is right. When I say synagogue, I ain't talking about no integration with no Johnny come lately imposter Jews. Some crackers who call themselves Jews. Netanyahu and all them boys. I ain't talking about them. I'm talking about the black Hebrew. The true Hebrew of scripture ain't got nothing to do with white folks they ain't Jews at all and unless we want to use that as some special term and sometime I come here I'll go into that whole thing about Jew Hebrew Israelite but we are the people who fulfill the Bible prophecies of the chosen of God and I'm not going to be one you will never catch me sitting on any talk show or sitting with any cracker and they call themselves him and me up and I'm sitting there saying, oh, I'm not anti-Jewish. I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm anti-whatever the hell they are. <laughs> whatever you are, goddammit, I'm against it, cracker. I know you ain't no Semite. I know you ain't the true Jew. I know you're not the true chosen people of God. I know you ain't none of that, but whatever you call yourself, I'm against it. Give a damn what it is. And I ain't gonna never say, I'm not against it. God is against you. And I'm not going to go against God and my ancestors by saying I'm not against you. I'm supposed to be against you. In fact, I get blessings for being against you. <laughs> see, that's what y'all like. See, you are. See, see, look at you. Look at you. You say, wow, why is Khalid coming so spiritual on us? You know what I'm saying? Yo, we went down, man, he came with some spiritual thing, you know? You know, we get that everywhere, you know, but just about everybody. Some group don't, different one, don't want to call the white man the devil no more. Say, so they don't use that word. If there's a God, there has to be a devil. Give me a break. Huh? What is God? What is devil? God is the essence of good God is good devil is the essence of evil devil is evil that's all don't spook it don't science it God equals good devil equals evil give me a break that's all it's that simple huh everybody get a A if you got that we can go home <laughs> No devil under the ground with no red pantyhose, no pink pitch, no pink pitchfork. No stick you and jug you and barbecue you on an eternal barbecue pit forever. Please. Your heaven and your hell. No God up in the sky riding on no damn cloud. Got a kingdom up in the sky, chilling, sitting back with a big throne. Come on. Babies don't believe that no more. Grown folks believe in this stuff. Your heaven and your hell, according to spirituality, according to what? Your heaven and your hell are right here on this earth. Your heaven and your hell are states of mind, states of being, planes of existence. You ain't got no money, you broke as hell. You got nothing to eat, you hungry as hell. You got nothing to drink, you thirsty as hell. You get caught out here when this weather's changing on you and ain't got your coat, you cold as hell. Summertime come, you ain't got no air conditioning, you ain't got no way to cool off, you hot as hell. Huh? You think this cracker's gonna change? You crazy as hell. It's not gonna change. You can't change. Don't mislead the people. Don't confuse the people.
Don't let them find you doing things and saying things that ties them up and confuses them. It's straight ahead. Straight ahead. Wake the people up. Raise the people from mental and spiritual death. Don't help bury them. Don't be like the ice maker, as we used to call the preacher, freezing the people's mind. No. Walk the water. Feed the masses. Feed the multitude. Not just food, but feed them the right supreme knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that will wake them up and raise them up, resurrect them from mental and spiritual death. If you don't know that the black man and woman, that we are from the very family of God, the infinite intelligence of the universe, the divine mind of the universe, the creative and regenerative power and force of the universe, if you don't know that we are of the very power and force of good, God of the universe, and if you don't know who the devil is, you don't have a chance. That's why Africa is in such bad shape. Nobody is teaching Africa a knowledge of self today. And nobody is teaching Africa that the white man is the devil. Nobody. You have abandoned that teaching today. Every one of the leaders has abandoned it today. You are afraid to teach that the white man is the devil. You want money today. You want contracts and goddamn contacts and to be seen today teach the people the truth that they are of the family of God the family of good the family of the righteous and it is the time for their resurrection and the white man is the goddamn devil who stands in their way that's what must be taught today get on these talk shows and you tiptoeing and you, you skating and skirting around the questions and skinning and grinning. <laughs> uh, damn it. Shameful for this to be going on. You destroy the spirituality of the people and so you herd them off and rush them into little religious groupings that mean nothing. These little religious houses mean nothing unless God is present, good is present, and true spirituality is there. And if you're black, and you all are, even Tiger Woods, <laughs> damn fool, talking about he's a Cala, Cabalasian. Now this nigga, we really made up something. You see how sick we are? We sick. I know it's supposed to be we are sick. That's a little Ebonics. We sick. <laughs> That's much worse than we are sick. We sick. That's what grandma would say. We sick. That's what big mama would say. We sick. Huh? That's what Amy A. A. Doris would say. We sick. Mama Lottie, Mama Carrie, we sick. Uncle Nap. They're plain and simple, straight to the point. Come on, Tiger Woods. But everybody's afraid to offend him. The only way you can reach this young man is to slap him upside his nappy head with the truth. Not with your hand, with the truth. Every time he looks around, he should have to face the truth everywhere he goes. And the cracker's making fun of him. Call him a fried chicken eating nigger. Collard greens eat nigger. They said, nigga, you might be Cala what? Huh? You might be a Calibanasian or whatever the hell you want to be, a Calibanasian or a cantaloupe or whatever, nigga. But you're a nigga to me. You can knock all the little white ball balls you want to in a black hole in black mother earth. Swinging your iron between your legs, as Dr. Francis Cress Welsing has given us the key to the size of these irons that you swing between the legs and knock this little scrawny white ball representing the white testicles of the white, scrawny white testicles of the white man who not only has a deficiency in melanin and the development of the pineal gland, but he fears, as the 
as the uh, 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 public enemy said, he fears a black planet. He's, Dr. Welsing says he fears genetic annihilation because he knows that you are dominant and he is recessive. So he plays games with balls, big brown balls for the NBA. Huh? <laughs> Little white scrawny balls for the masters. You ain't no master. You gonna be a master. And this fool, they just let niggas in the masters in the 90s and ain't but two niggas there now that don't carry the, 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 the you know, that don't cut the grass and clean out the traps and put a new uh, e uh, extra roll of tissue <laughs> in the toilet so they won't run out, the crackers won't run out. This nigga really goes in there with the power of God because he's an original black man. Tell me nothing about his mama. She was present. <laughs> but she had an encounter with the black man. <laughs> makes all the difference in the world. Maybe don't nobody else know, but you ought to know, sister. You ought to know. If you don't know, you better ask somebody. <laughs> yes, his mama was present. What is she? Uh, from Thailand. You know, that ain't too far away. She ain't no white woman. Huh? She might want to be honorary white. Now, he wants to be honored. He said, look, I'll be anything, but don't make me black. I don't want to be African. You know, and I, I, you know, just let me in, the masters. You know what he had to go through to get in the masters? Huh? Now they're sorry they let him in. A baby from the cradle, what they call a nigger baby, a nigger fried chicken, collard green eating baby. He might get a little Thai barbecue every now and then if his mama feel all right. <laughs> get a little Thai food. I like a little Thai food too. It's a nice Thai restaurant there in uh, Brooklyn on, um, where is that? On 7th and Lincoln Place. Good Thai restaurant if you just got Tiger Woods thoughts. <laughs> You want to get some good Thai food? They got good food, good vegetables, good everything. So he might get a little Thai food every now and then, but the crackers just see him as a nigga. You've heard me say before, no matter what you do to the white man, no matter what you do in his presence, you still a nigga. O.J. Simpson, all the money, run football, take 11 crackers on his back and carry the coach or the opposite team and run a touchdown, slam the football down, and all 13 of the Pecker was in the end zone. He's still a nigger. The nigger who went to Atlanta to run for president, Alan Keyes, is that his name? Yeah. Running for Republican Party. Tell me he wanted to, the Democrats ain't no damn good, neither one of them. We need freedom and independence, a nation of our own. Separation is the only solution. Don't you let nobody get on these televisions and making these fancy speeches tell you that, well, yeah, well, separation is, a, you know, is a last resort. And, you know, if we can't do this and if we can't do that, then we will consider separation. God has ordained separation. And the most honorable Elijah Muhammad does not say, if we can't. He says, since we can't. And in case you don't understand this peck of woods language, there's a big difference in the preposition if and since. Since is a foregone conclusion. Since ends the conversation. Since say we've been through all the BS and all the rest. And now we are wise and otherwise. And we ain't got to go through it no more. Since means everything to be done has already been done. Since means we know you and we know you and we know you. And we know that you are absolutely disagreeable to get along with in peace and that no one has been able to get along with you, white man, in peace anywhere on the face of the planet Earth. So since we can't get along with you, 
God's messenger and warner in our midst, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, says that this is the time for the separation, he said, of the black man and woman from the white man and woman. He said this is the best and only solution. Damn, he said this is the best. If he would have stopped right there, you might have a case. Johnny Cochran could come in <laughs> and if you, I mean, could probably win the case for you. He could probably win for you. But he said this is the best and only solution. Case closed. I'm for separation. I'm a separatist. I ain't like these nuts that's coming up every week. These cracker nuts. There's some crackers in Texas that took two hostages. Then you got the, 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 the what you call the militia and the, the, what you got this other group, the Freeman. And these cats are with the Republic of Texas. Then you had the cracker, heaven, what's the gate? Heaven's Gate. What was the cracker's name? Apple White. I've seen a damn white apple. <laughs> apple White. Take all them fools and they all die. They met a nigga in there. He was not a black man. I said nigger. I make a distinction between nigger, negro, colored, and African and black. One day I'll come and teach on all of those. The difference in an African, the difference in black, the difference in colored, the difference in, uh, did it, what did I say, African, colored, black, Negro, nigger, the difference in all of them, all of them, is a difference. Apple white, they look at a comet and see an eclipse of the moon and just go buck wild. They say, all oh, that stuff happening, this is it. Now here we are reading about the peck of wood. Watching him on TV, and he and all them people, Jim Jones, took all them people down. So I'm not talking about some nut. The white man has a, is a nut and has built the most powerful, uh, savage, uncivilized, wicked nation in the history of the world based on the principle of separation. Separated from the British Empire. Huh? Separated from King George, right? George Washington, Patrick Henry, Paul Revere, Ben Franklin, John Adams, and the boys they call the Minutemen. I don't know why they call them the Minutemen. That's between them and their wives. I ain't gonna get into that. That's all right, this is Queens. Y'all take a little longer. <laughs> That's because you have to think over it. You don't just jump out there. You, you think over it. Oh, that clean it up sufficiently. <laughs> I mean, I heard the different levels of laughter. I heard laughter, and somebody was still figuring out. Then they said, oh, that's what he mean. <laughs> then somebody else said, well, damn, everybody laughing. Then you had that third tier of laughter. <laughs> they try to really join in with all of the first two, like you understood from the very beginning. Some of y'all still don't understand. <laughs> When it's over, come up to me and I'll pull you to the side and whisper to you what I mean when I say that I won't get involved in that, why their wives call them the minute men. <laughs> but really they call them the minute men because of their quick response. And in a, no, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a minute, no, I'm real now. In a minute, they would respond to defend the colonies against the onslaught of the British Empire, which was so vast and so powerful at that time until they say the sun never set on it. These are important meetings we have. These are important meetings, and as you are on these videos, years from now, these videos will be played. And some of the young, young, young ones in here, you'll be looking at these videos one day. Say, look at me with my glasses on. That's me. What's your name? What's his name? Huh, sir? Brother Courtney. Look at Brother Courtney. He'll have this video one day. His wife will be laughing at him. His wife would be saying, that's you, Courtney? <laughs> he would say, yeah, baby. That's me. <laughs> so you know I don't wear Courtney no more. I'm, you know, I don't wear Courtney no more. You know, I'm king so-and-so, so-and-so. Uh, 
He'll have some powerful African name, and she'll have some powerful African name. But he'll be looking at this. He'll be looking at this video from D and J here tonight. These are important sessions that we're having for the onward movement and advancement, the level of consciousness and culture and spirituality of our people. Dr. Maulana Karanga has taught us that black is color, culture, consciousness, and with his permission, I have added that black is color, culture consciousness and a corresponding spiritual and cosmic connection. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Hotel. We'll take a few questions. You cannot separate the spiritual from the material. The spiritual and the material are interdependent. We would not even know that the spiritual existed unless there was some material manifestation to manifest the spiritual through, right? We would not know that the material had any power unless there was spirituality to move the physical or the material. So spiritual and material are dependent upon each other. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. We can take just one or two questions. It's just 9.30. We'll be out of here in a minute. Everybody cool? I'm tomorrow night at the... It's, third, it's not tomorrow night? Where, where am I? African Portrait Theater. How many know where the African Portrait Theater is? In, in? They didn't give me religion versus spirituality. What did they give me? Uh-oh. That is, that's knockdown drag out there. <laughs> that's Thursday night at 7. What's the address? Anybody know? 17603. Jamaica Avenue. Can't miss it. Thursday night, 7 o'clock. Yes, sir. I don't get the invitations anymore. You know, I think Gary Bird is scared of me. I think I'm just a little too, it's too much, I don't know that, because I used, well, I mean, I don't get an invitation, I used to be on all the time. Bird, I'm going to say this Thursday night, too. If he's sitting in the audience, I'm going to say, are you scared of me, brother, M Hotel? What's happening? Why I don't get an invitation anymore? After the president came out against me, the vice president, the senate, the congress, Jesse Jackson, Kwesi and Fume, Ben Chavis, What's his name? Bill Gray. Then my spiritual father uh, suspended me from position, his, as the position as his spokesman and assistant. And all that controversy started. M. Hotep said, Hotep. <laughs> <laughs> See? That's what y'all like. See? <laughs> See? <laughs> so ask him when you send. Say, why you never have Dr. Khaled Muhammad on anymore? Say, give him, anybody take my number. Everybody take my number so you can say, well, I don't have his number. So he, here's his number. He made 212-330-9338. Brother Ari calls me all the time just to check on me. He called me a few days ago. Said, I haven't heard from you, brother. I've been in Europe. Sneaked across the border in Canada because I'm banned in Canada. We're trying to get something going up there. All throughout the banned in Canada, all throughout the South. We almost got arrested a few days ago in D.C. because I'm banned from Coward University. And uh, my, uh, one of my top students, uh, attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz, who is a graduate of, of Howard University and the Howard University Law School, was arrested week before last just for passing out flyers on the campus where he graduated from. He's banned from the campus. I'm banned, so we went to challenge the ban last week. Police everywhere, helicopters. We went on the campus, all of the top administrators came out, the students came out and cheered us, and one or two students attempted to challenge us, said that we weren't welcome at Howard, that it affected scholarships when we come to campus, and. It, it affected the university's funding, and 
you know, the Jew came on the news that evening, Howard University as a white imposter Jew as the spokesman for this black university. He came on and <laughs> spoke for the university against us that evening. I mean, it was real silly for them to use this cracker, but they used him. Um, then, you know, I've been doing some work with the December 12th movement with Brother Coltrane Chimaranga, Sister Viola Plummer, and I've got to do something while I'm here to try and help as much as I can on the uh, freeing of the great uh, revolutionary brother Abdul Haq. And I was just contacted by um, um, Sister, the mother of Brother Limerick Nelson. We're doing a fundraiser for Brother Limerick Nelson. I think it's the 17th of this month. Then I have to be over, I think it's the 14th, over in Philly with Sister Ramona Africa and the Africa family of MOVE dealing with uh, the, uh, the uh, no, dealing with the, what we call the outrage on Osage when they burned down, killed all of, the, many of the MOVE family and um, the Africa family of the MOVE organization and imprisoned the others and Sister Ramona just got out and um, they got some little settlement that some Negroes are criticizing her because they got a little settlement. She lost her whole family in that fire and in that bomb. And that little, little money they gave her, she deserves that and much, much more. And none of it will bring back her family. You got some Negroes criticizing her for uh, receiving the little money. And I want to go over and be with them on Osage Avenue. Then there's another radical group in Philadelphia that's, that's in Philly, in Philadelphia, who was very upset when the black mother and the two little, uh, little brothers were beat so badly by these 50 crackers or so in um, Philadelphia. And, you know, there's some real radical elements there who want me to come in and deal with that. So just quickly, so I was just saying, so I haven't been here a lot. I haven't been home to New York in a, over a month and a half. Almost. And just trying to organize all over the country and working with the New Black Panther Party um, and trying to rebuild the New Black Panther Party. You, some of you saw us on, on some of the national networks, CNN, NBC, CBS, when we went down with all of the guns when they were burning the black churches down there in Texas. <coughs> we went in and took over some towns. <laughs> it was a good feeling, you know? <laughs> I mean, I can't lie to you. It's one of the best feelings of my life. I'm getting criticism and flack from some people. Some Muslims are criticizing. You, you were down there with all them guns? I'd rather be down there with guns than not. So don't criticize me about guns. I believe in guns. I believe that I should go after my enemy with my God and with my gun. If a million men showed up in D.C. with guns, huh? White man, that's what I told him. You better listen to Minister Farrakhan because you got, might have a million black men in the wings if you don't listen to him that's ready to make a move on you like that. I don't mean no little pea shooters. And there are many black men and black women who were trained in all of the white man's armies and militaries and all of his campaigns of war all over the world. And they know his weapons. They know his computerized stuff. They know his sophisticated and smart stuff and his maneuvers and tactics. Let me finish with Brian. Yeah, brother, brother, uh, I met you last year with my son on, on, on uh, last year in May. Uh, I just got back from the Right, I had been before, but it was the first time I could get that many Muslims from the nation who would come. If I'm in the city, I'll be there. Oh, is that right? Mm. Oh, May 19th, all right. Born on Brother Malcolm's birthday. That's a blessing. So, it is. Well, May is the, the birthday. Uh, month of Malcolm, May 19th, May 29th, and we have to do something this year. May 29th is the anniversary of my assassination attempt. So Malcolm born in that month, and they tried to take me out in that month. 
And this year we have to have something. Uh, I can't keep letting that day go by because Malcolm did not get this opportunity. After Sunday, February 21st, 1965 at the Audubon Auditorium, he didn't get the opportunity to come and speak on religion versus spirituality or whatever. He didn't get that opportunity. Of course, we are still enriched. Malcolm made some mistakes, all of us do. But we are enriched by the life of Malcolm in many ways, more than we probably, most of us, even realize. So to be blessed to still be here after being shot with a nine millimeter and four or five around me shot in the chest and shoulder, took all of the first bullets for me, ex-crips and ex-bloods who were trucing, taking off their red and their blue, wearing black all around me, uh, and a 30 odd six rifle where the scope was found. So May 29th is very special to me, and of course May 19th is special to me, and uh, I'm gonna try to do something this year uh, to commemorate and thank uh, the Oluwa, uh, God, as our ancestors say in some parts of the world, the Oluwa, uh, for, for still being here, or Allah for still being here. Um, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Um, Messiah actually means to be washed clean or wiped clean. Messiah is a savior that is raised up among the people to redeem the people. In one part of Africa we call such one, some consider it a cultural term, some consider it a spiritual, spiritual term, some consider it a cultural, spiritual, or political term. Kwame Nkrumah was called Osajifo. Osajifo Kwame Nkrumah. Osajifo really has an extent ended greater, deeper meaning, which means the redeemer of the people, one who comes to redeem the people. The Messiah comes to wipe or wash the people clean and to free the people from the clutches of Satan or the clutches of the world. Christ means to be crystallized. Christ means also the most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches, as I was taught by the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, that Christ means the crusher, not only one who crystallizes, but the crusher, one who comes to crush the rule of the wicked and to crystallize the people into oneness with God. Uh, the Mahdi. Mahdi is, is, is a Muslim term. The Mahdi, it is said, is to come, and the Mahdi is to break the cross, is to break the cross, kill the swine, destroy tyranny, and set judgment in the earth. Technically, there are those who say there is a difference in the Mahdi and the Messiah. Some say that the Mahdi and the Messiah would be here at the same time time. Well, that could mean two things. Either it means that the power of the Messiah would be in one and the power of the Mahdi would be in another, or when you say they would be here at the same time, it could mean that it would be in the same person. When I made one of my sacred pilgrimages to the holy city of Mecca and outside of Mecca to Medina at the, what is called the Masjid al-Nabi, the Prophet's Mosque, there is supposed to be the tomb of Jesus, the Messiah, and it is left empty. You have others buried, golden doors, but the tomb for Jesus is left empty in the Islamic world in Medina because it is believed that the, that the Messiah would return with the Mahdi, 
and be present at the same time as the Mahdi. And when the Messiah is to be buried, they say that he would be buried in that particular tomb. I don't know if he'll be buried there or not, but that's the belief. So Mahdi, the, as I just mentioned to you, uh, those are the things they say of the Mahdi. Technically, they have similar work. In some instances, it is talking about different aspects of the same work by the same man. In other, uh, according to other terms of reasoning, it represents the work of two different ones. Uh, but it's just like we were saying earlier about God. Different nations in different tongues and languages talking about the same one God call that same one God by different names. But they're talking about the same power and force of the universe. Other nations have messiahs, saviors. Cursey Graves in his book, 16 Crucified Saviors or Christianity Before Christ. I'm sure they have it here. What's brother's name that owns the books, Dr. David? Brother David. I'm sure he probably has uh, Cursey Graves' book, 16 Crucified Saviors or Christianity Before Christ. I just debated um, at the same university and had an opportunity to rebut the arguments of um, Dr. Mary Lef Lefowich, who wrote the book, I call her, I call her Lefa bitch, uh, uh, Lefa witch, who wrote the book, Not Out of Africa. Uh, she says that Dr. Ben, Dr. Dr. Clark, she says Dr. Malefi Asante, Dr. Jeffries, Dr. Karenga, uh, Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop, Dr. George G.M. James. She says that all of them, that their works are not history at all. They have no historical value whatsoever. So she wrote the book, as I said, not out of Africa, how Afrocentrism became an excuse to teach myth as history. So she was at San Diego State. I had just spoken at San Francisco State to all of the black, they had their big conference in San Francisco State of all of the black student leaders from the black student unions, African student unions, and PASUs, Pan-African Student Unions. So I got to speak to all of the heads there in California at uh, San Francisco State. Then I left to go to San Diego City and speak earlier in the day, then San Diego State later that night. So the students, the white faculty brought Mary Lefowitz in to speak on not out of Africa. The black students brought me in to speak on not out of Europe. <laughs> and so <laughs> it was, my subject was not out of Europe, too black, too strong. And uh, you got to get that tape. It's, it's a good tape. I crushed <laughs> I crushed I believe the debates have to be that way. The debate can't be a draw. The people can't be wondering about their belief. Uh, well, he didn't, he wasn't too decisive. No, when the people lead a debate, they got to feel like you crushed the enemy. That you just wipe the enemy out. Don't take no prisoners. You know, you kill the enemy, then burn the enemy. You know, then boil the ashes, then flush the ass ashes down the commode. Twelve email. The uh, in the Islamic world, the talk, and I'd like to teach a, a lecture on that because it's a beautiful, beautiful subject. The Islamic world talks about the twelfth imam. That's in a positive sense, and in the Hebrew world, I'm just mixing these just for a second. Talks about the twelfth tribe. But that, that's something else on the 12th tribe. But I wanted to put that out there. The 12th Imam, the Muslims talk of the power that the 12th Imam would have. During the uh, period of the so what is called the Sahabas, or the companions of Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, after his departure, and the caliphate was set up. The first caliph was uh, Abu Bakr, the second was, uh, o, uh, was uh, Omar, then Uthman, then Ali, and his sons Hassan and Hussein tried to avenge, his, uh, the family tried to avenge his death during 
and ultimately they were killed in various ways. Um, this 12th Imam is supposed to usher in a certain reign of power that is rooted in divine and is supposed to, some schools say, is supposed to be able to unite the tribes of Islam or the different beliefs of Islam because uh, there's so many schools of thought and no central leadership. Um, some say, mostly critics in another way, say that this 12th Imam will further, will further create a schism and a gap and that there would be great bloodshed around, surrounding this 12th Imam. Well, either way, no matter what school you believe from, it could be great bloodshed, even if he's bringing them all together, that could be great bloodshed. If he's not, that could be great bloodshed. But in general, this is the history of the Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, and what is said by different schools of thought, and the 12th Imam. Okay. It's a good question. It's on the minds and hearts of a lot of the people here, I'm sure. Malcolm did survive. Malcolm is more alive today than he was when he was physically alive, in a sense, in a great sense. Malcolm's picture is everywhere. Malcolm's words are being meditated on and acted on by many all over the world. Malcolm... Um, did not have the great prominence during his lifetime that he has in his physical absence from among us. So his spirit is still alive among us. Back to spirituality. In Yoruba culture, we talk about the egun. And the egun, or the egun gun, represents the spiritual nature of our ancestors. And the Holy Quran teaches us, speak not of the righteous as being dead, for they are not dead, but you perceive not. And in African thought and practice and culture, we don't believe that certain of our ancestors died. We believe that the Egun lives on. And we believe that when we leave this plane of life, we join the realm of the ancestors, 
uh, we, after we reached, some of us don't reach the elder state. Some of us die before we reach elder state. But if we go through the full cycle of life, cycle of life, we, we, from elder, we move to the ego, or to the ancestors. That's our spiritual belief. So we don't look on, in African culture, we don't look on what is called death in the same way that the white European looks on death. We see death differently. Now that's hard for us because we've been trained by a foster parent who is the devil. So we have his concept of death. So it's horrifying to all of us to lose, as we even use the term, well, we in general, we mean losing their physical presence and seeing it. Let me get right back to what you're saying. Um, direction, you ask. What is my direction? Well, at this point in my life, you know, when Malcolm was no longer with the Nation of Islam, he started the Muslim Mosque Incorporated, which was a religious organization, basically. And from the Muslim Mosque Incorporated, he realized that he couldn't get as many black people or reach as many black people as he would like to reach from the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. It was too religiously confining. And there were Christians who would not join. There were those who didn't believe in no God at all who wouldn't join, uh, who wouldn't even come around. And we could help their spirituality. We could teach them if we could reach them. But if they didn't come around, there's nothing we could do. You know, uh, that, that's now. There's nothing we can do if we can't reach them, we can't teach them. Malcolm, I think, realized that 30-something years ago. So he started the OAAU, similar to the OAU, based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the Organization of African Unity. He called it the Organization of African American Unity. Um, it was the building, an attempt at building an African United Front, a black united front that would transcend religion, transcend political ideology, transcend uh, doctrine and all of that, uh, would transcend doctrinal beliefs and try to ultimately ease everybody together. And as Malcolm said, accept black nationalism as their goal and philosophy. Um, I still consider myself, I almost sound just like him saying that, I still consider, my, consider myself a Muslim. <laughs> Hear who Malcolm said that. I still consider myself a Muslim, and I still credit Minister Farrakhan for what I am and who I am and what I am becoming. Malcolm said the same words about the Arab Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> and that's true. It's true. I still see Minister Farrakhan as my, I still open up. I mean, I just can't get away from it. I don't care where I am. I don't care how upset I am with him. Upset with him? Yeah, damn right I'm upset with him. I, have a, I get upset with God sometimes. And I go in a room and say, look, we got to talk. <laughs> if you've got a good relationship with God, you ought to be able to talk to God. Right. Huh? You got to say, look, now, yo, what, what are you doing? Why you doing me like this? You know, what, 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 what is this? You know, and as the old folks say, have mercy. <laughs> You've got to talk to God. So if I've talked to God and questioned God, Minister Farrakhan taught me that way. i got to question my spiritual father. If I see him do something and it doesn't seem right, i got to question that. I have a right to question that. I was always taught in Islam that the Christian church and the preacher didn't want you to question nothing. I've heard many Muslim ministers say that the preachers say, I don't, don't, don't. Don't question the word of God. God didn't mean for man to know everything. Don't question God. But I was taught in the nation of Islam, question everything. Question everybody. Ask questions and find out all about yourself. And find out about whatever it is you're asking and find out all you can about the one you're asking about. So if I see my spiritual father I can't get away from calling him my spiritual father because though the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, is the one who laid that foundation, I never met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I stood honor guard on the porch of the palace once, supposed to be a crack soldier, but I when he was this close, but I could, somebody was standing in my way, so the soldier was leaning 
just a little. I was supposed to be right in line with everybody. I leaned a little bit so I could get a glimpse of him. But I've never met him. I never even shook his hand. So the spiritual father of my faith and my revolutionary zeal, yes, it comes from God Almighty to begin with. And Lottie B. and Harold and Carrie and Davan, it comes from them, yes. But the man who shaped me and molded me and fashioned me is Minister Louis Farrakhan. Do I still love him? Yes. Am I angry with him? As I said earlier, you're damn right I'm angry with him. I can't imagine what's going on. I don't know what's happening. I can't understand. I, I thought I would be with the Nation of Islam my whole life. I would never imagine being out kicked to the curb, dogged. When I was shot, not one word was said by Minister Park. He never had a speech on it. He never had a press conference on it. He never said a public word about it. Nothing was ever said, not one word. I've had a chance to say what I'm saying to you, to him, face to face. It took me three years, almost three and a half years, to get the serious meeting that I had with him just before the so-called World's Day of Atonement at the UN. Why do I say so-called? Say, God damn it, if you can atone with the whole world, you can't atone with me. You can have a sissy like Ben Chavis. What's his claim to fame? Trying to steal eighty to $300,000 to buy some woman's sex? We just got to read the book upstairs. You can get it on your way out or look at it by the white so-called Jew, Arthur Majida, the prophet of rage. He gives you the transcript of Ben Chavis' letter that he faxed to Abraham Foxman, the so-called Jew of the ADL over in New Jersey that Sunday in January of 94 when they put the full page ad against me in the Jew York Times. The first, as the phone rang, Ben Chavis is the first one to call Abraham Foxman on the phone, thanking him for condemning me in the New York Times. <laughs> then eating cheese and buck dancing, telling Foxman, I'm speaking at the Smithsonian Institution this, e Institute this e evening, and I'm faxing you a copy of my speech condemning Collett tonight. You got a buck dance for the Jew? What you calling the damn Jew? That's collaboration with the enemy. I call it what it is. All right, I can't do nothing but die. It would be foolish to kill me. To kill me, my strong, uncompromising, revolutionary, unyielding, unbending position, to make me a martyr would be a hell of a mistake. It would override and overcome all this weak stuff that's out here more in my death than in my life. Because then people will hold on to you every word, study everything, read everything about you. Then the questions about who killed Malcolm would be more, uh, would be more on the minds of the people after Khaled is killed than it has been probably during the latter part of this last 30 years. So what I have attempted to do is to travel this country and Europe and throughout Africa East Coast, West Coast, here in the South, so-called Midwest here in the country, trying to build an African United Front, um, hold on to the teaching that I have been given, draw from the best of it, stand on the strong foundation and platform that was given to me by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and As I move, move according to the way God and the Spirit guides me. Um, which is what Minister Farrakhan is doing in the absence of his teaching. There are things that he has decided to do that his teacher did not do. I can't criticize it because now in the absence of his teacher, he stands on the foundation that his teacher left, but with his teacher not here, he has to move according to circumstances and situations according to the way he feels and the way he's guided. So now that I don't have my father, spiritual father, Minister Farrakhan, right there anymore, 
I have to make decisions on my own. I don't want to go out a punk. I don't want to go out weak. I intend to die the death of a revolutionary. I intend to die the death of a freedom fighter. That's the only way to go. I don't intend to capitulate. I don't intend to water down a damn thing. Somebody has to hold the line. That's what my teacher who was my captain taught me. He's gone on to the ancestors now. Captain Ali Rashid. He taught me, taught all of us, hold a line. That's what he always used to say. Hold a line. You got to hold a line. I got to hold a line. Now the quarterback can do whatever he want to do. The end can do whatever he want to do, but I'm going to hold the line. Ain't nothing coming through. I'm holding the line. And I'm not backing up. And if the Crackers team is on the field, if his offense is working, I'm blitzing. I'm blitzing like a hard-nosed linebacker. That's the only thing I can do to answer your question in terms of my direction. I've written Minister Farrakhan. I've called him. That's the end of the day. Oh. Man, how do we have one tape? Oh, 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 oh. Phew. Let's say, God, this tape is going to get kind of controversial. People are going to be getting it. Let me take it to the mosque. I want them to hear this tape. Well, you don't have to take the tape. Tell the mosque to invite me. I'll come and raise these questions at the mosque. For me not to be permitted in any mosque in the country. I used to be the minister here at number seven. The minister came and installed me. Minister Farrakhan is the minister here. Some of you were there. Some of you got the tape. He said, I offer to you the best minister that we have in the nation of Islam. He said, I don't know another more skilled in debate, that more knowledgeable of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He went on to say, he's knowledgeable of the 5%. He's knowledgeable of the Hebrew. He's knowledgeable of the politics, Sunni Islam, of this, of that, of so on. He went on. He said he's supremely intelligent. These are his words. Made me the minister here. I went to mosque number seven. Alake was with me. We went to mosque number seven. And I think I was in there five minutes. I sat down, got checked, and sat down. It hurt me so badly. Five minutes later, the lieutenant is touching me on the shoulder. I'm being ushered back to the check room. And the then regional captain said, you know, we just talked to headquarters, Chicago, and they said you are not permitted in any mosque in the nation of Islam until you and Minister Farrakhan can talk further. Um, I spoke at the World Day of Atonement at the UN. Everybody was just as happy. I was happy too. I ran into Minister Farrakhan at a funeral in Chicago. Brother Amir, Brother Omer Gurney, died. He was very close to me when I was the Supreme Captain and when I was National Spokesman, but in particular when I was Supreme Captain. So I went to his funeral and bumped into Minister Farrakhan at the funeral. That's how I got to see him. And I had a chance to sit with him and raise all the questions I've had on my mind for the past three years. And with no disrespect, unless just asking was disrespectful, but my tone certainly wasn't disrespectful. My manner wasn't disrespectful. I don't know how to be that way with him. But I questioned him on everything I could question. Him. He told me the next time we met, which would be just before the UN or somewhere around that time, he would answer all my questions. I ended up, that hasn't happened. And um, before that, I called, I don't know how many times, over the years. A, an appointment would be set and then it would be changed and no new one would be set. I would keep trying, I'd give up for a while, get hurt for a while, get mad for a while, to try back again, i get another appointment, and when that one would come, it would be canceled. Now some of you say, and I don't give a damn what you say, and for those of you who will go back and tell your little friends, and some of you who will go to the mosque, maybe nobody in here is like that, but Khaled know he lying on the ministry. He, all he got to do is just go see the minister, write the ministry. If he wanted to get to the ministry, he could... Well, let me say this, goddammit. The minister has much more power than I do. And by the same token that you say, if Khaled really wanted to get with the minister, 
he could get with the minister. It is a million times more uh, important to me to say, and certainly much more of the truth to say, if Minister Farrakhan wanted to talk to me, it would be just as easy, not even, even almost snapping his finger. If you call me at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to find a way to get there. Anytime. But for some reason, he has not called me in. Um, right after the World's Day of Atonement, as they call it, at the UN, different Muslim ministers started inviting me to do events in their city. They thought everything was cool. Headquarters in Chicago said, cancel that event. You can't bring Khalid into this city, into your city. They said, but we saw him at the World's Day of Atonement. We saw him. They said in New Jersey at the Newark Mosque, they said the believers say, well, we saw him. They were told, don't you believe what your eyes, what your eyes saw. <laughs> I'm supposed to debate this devil on May 3rd. What's today's day? May 3rd, I debate this devil in Los Angeles. It's a big thing in L.A. I'm debating this devil, Anthony Hilder. Anybody know Anthony Hilder? This is a devil that's got a lot of videos out. Millennium 2000, 666, the mark of the beast, the new world order. I'm so supposed, supposed to debate him on May 3rd in Los Angeles, uh, 108th and Broadway. I'm, I'm sorry, 108th and Western, 108th and Western. On the subject, is the white man the devil? And how does this play into the hands of the New World Order and the Illuminati? Another student uh, that I worked with and trained in Atlanta, Minister Tony Muhammad, is the minister in L.A. now. He was given orders by headquarters, and he had a big holdover meeting just a few days ago in L.A. Two brothers in L.A. were working. The tickets were being sold at their bookstore. And play. They were told they couldn't handle anything. Anymore. They couldn't deal with the event. None of the Muslims could attend the event. I talked to brother, what's the owner of the bookstore name, Brother David? He said he talked to the Muslims who meet here. I think they have study groups here. And he had invited them out. He just told me that. He said, they said, no, we, we can't come out. We, we can't come. And some of them, uh, most of them love me. But it's just a question. I haven't been put in bad standing officially. I haven't been, I'm not in good standing officially. I haven't been put out, but I'm not in. Um, I've had no e hearing. I've had no trial. No official charges have been brought against me. I keep asking, charge me with something. Give me an official hearing and trial and charge me with something. Even the devil will charge you, give you your damn time, or the gas chamber, or the electric chair, or lethal injection, or whatever. I just want to, whatever it is, charge me. Keen College, I ain't figured out what happened yet. I don't understand that. I fought those devils and defeated all of them and tore up the damn world defending my leader and teacher. They call him for his death outside of the auditorium at Keene College while I'm speaking inside. I'm with Newark. Newark ain't gonna roll with me. When I was in LA, they were calling for the minister's death outside of the Los Angeles Convention Center. That's my posse. We went outside, knocked the hell out of the Jews and ran their behinds down the street. So I made war from the podium at Keene College. And I get suspended. I don't understand that. Huh? Well, the minister told you about your language and you, you know that you should. Look, I'm, I'm at war. I'm calling for the death of my leader. What am I supposed to say? You guys shouldn't do that. Don't say that about the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. God won't like that. I said, you no good bastards. I talked about the Pope. I don't have no respect for the Pope. You can't make me respect the Pope. I'm not getting on no TV shows. Talk, talking in a way that will make you think the Pope is all right. He's not only the Pope of Rome, he's the punk of Rome. He's an imposter. Tell me he's the vicar of Christ. He's not the vicar of Christ. Some homosexual sitting up there, some old freakish man. We don't know what's under that damn robe. You might find out that the Pope is really Mother Superior. When you're fighting the enemy, you're not polite with the enemy. There are certain diplomatic moments when enemies give respect to each other. But other times, it's psychological warfare, it's physical warfare, it's 
It's warfare on every plane. I'm at war. So I have no special way except under special circumstances to deal with the enemy. We have two more and we'll, three more and we'll finish. My brother. All right. No, I came here by myself. I go everywhere that I have to go by myself. These brothers came to secure me. They were trying to round up as many as they could from Jersey and bring them over. So I was here an hour before they got here. I was, and I appreciate the, the group of brothers and sisters that they brought with them. But when I got out of the car and Brother Salim, so I came, I just flew in, landed at the Newark airport, rented a car, drove straight here, and he said, brother, where are you security? God is sufficient. What's that cracker's name? Reagan. Had the best security money can buy. The Pope. Best security money can buy and still got shot. Security can't save you. Only God can save you. That's all. They'll kill your damn security and kill you. And then kill the doctor that come to work on you. So, I mean, I mean, that might sound foolish to some, but you still got to be secure. I can't go and hide. I got a work to do. If any of you stand with me, then I got security. If you never stand with me, I'm not going to stop because you don't stand with me. I stand alone and continue to do what I got to do. Many just like forums. They just want some speech making. I want to commit themselves to nothing. And some fear for their lives, scared to death. I've had sisters in my latter years in quest for a wife. I've had sisters that say, don't you want me to die with you? <laughs> a sister said that to me. <laughs> she said, you want me to die with you? I'm not going to die with you. That's what she said to me, as God is my witness, exact words. I'm not going to die with you. Don't you want one of us to live? <laughs> Bless her heart. I mean, I can't even, as Tupac would say, I ain't mad with her. <laughs> Girl wanted to live, so. <laughs> she went on. She's Afrocentric. She's all of that, but. And she was there for me when I got shot and packing pistols and everything, but. When the real deal came down, she said, hey, I'm sorry, I'm gone. <laughs> Plus, too many other things of, you know, the, all of the friction and stuff that come from that that has bothered you and bothered it, I'm gone. Do you want me to die with you? I had this, another sister, I was, I, I'm just dropping it, I ain't gonna tell you no names, I ain't gonna let you all off into my business. <laughs> this is some time back and I was, she's a, she's a singer. She was all excited about me and stuff, and I thought we were going to dinner, and I called her for dinner. Somebody, she didn't know who I really was. Somebody told her who I really was. <laughs> As God is my witness, she said, but if I go out with you, I might get shot. <laughs> As God is my witness, she said, I might get shot. So. I don't fear for my life. I catch the train, I drive, I catch the plane. I walk in a school by myself and students come up out of the audience and different people and secure me. As Brother Salim and, and as these brothers have come here tonight, uh, 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 Minister Craig and Brother Carlos, Brother Ja 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 and Brother, Brother Craig, you can tell me. And Brother Akil, who I know very well, and others that came. But I mean, I, I can't stay home and say, well, I ain't got no security. I, I, bet, I don't know who's going to secure me at the Anthony Hilder debate on whether he's the devil out in L.A. And that's where I almost got killed in L.A. And that's where Biggie Smalls got killed on the West Coast. That's where Tupac got killed on the West Coast. You know, I don't, I don't fear death. Fear death for what? Death probably scared of me. <laughs> Death probably scared. Me. Yes, sir. We almost finished. 
Oh, yes. I met with Brother Kwame uh, a week or so ago in San Francisco, and that's what he wanted to talk to me about, was the new Black Panther Party, give me advice and counsel on the party, because he was really one of the founders. You know, history says Huey and Bobby, but it was really, it was really out of Brother Kwame Toure and others out of the Lyons County, that political party down in Lyons County down in the south that had the symbol of the Panther. And then it was brought up to the Bay Area. And um, so he was telling me all of the things that happened and filling me in and just giving me good counsel and advice. Brother Kwame is one of the few. Brother Kwame is one of the few who, <laughs> who, uh, Brother, you told that like you were tearing a cracker's head off, man. <laughs> you said, Don't nobody stand with me. I hope you're wrong with me, brother. <laughs> uh, um, one of the few who has not punked out and has not given up. Even with uh, prostate cancer, he's standing strong and tall. I think it's prostate. I know it's cancer. Um, you can call him at 3 o'clock in the morning. He answers the phone, ready for the revolution. That's right now. He hasn't let up. Still on the move. Um, I'm working with Brother Aaron Michaels, a young brother in Dallas, Texas, who came to my side after my assassination attempt. Because after I left L.A., when I left the hospital, I went to another friend's house, a Brother Shahid. He really hurt me because he never stood guard or stood post or second the whole time I was there. So one day I just disappeared out of there. I couldn't walk. And I got out of there. This sister that I was telling you about, the one who said, you want me to die with you? They were there. They had their guns and everything. They said, she said then at that time, we don't know who this assassination attempt came from. So we got to watch everybody. And so we got out of there, and another brother named Steve Washington took me into Dallas. And he had three or four safe houses set up for me every day. I might go to one house, let everybody see me, go in the front door, go out the back door. Five minutes later, 20 minutes later, might go in the front door and crawl out the window. One o'clock in the morning and go to another safe house, just changing places. I did that for a long time because I didn't know, I couldn't trust nobody except that immediate group. Brother Steve Coakley came in, stayed with me in the house, and uh, Dr. Sims, who's gone on to the ancestors now, and a few others. But that's when, the, when Brother Aaron Michaels came around me in Dallas. And uh, they came around me with all kinds of weapons. And people were saying, you got all them guns around you. You know the messenger don't teach you about no guns. And I said, look, fool, I just damn near got killed. If anybody come to kill me now, I want to make sure that we can answer back. And he said, you don't believe in Allah. If you believed in Allah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have, you believe in the gun. I said, no, I believe in Allah and I believe in the gun. And I pray that he'll bless me to shoot straight when it's time to shoot. So that's when I got with Brother Aaron Michaels and the New Black Panther Party, way back around my assassination attempt. That relationship has grown, and I was able to organize them and start moving to the areas where the ch black churches were being burned. We patrolled black communities. We stood guard at some of the churches. Uh, yes, we, we, are, we were giving respect to the houses of worship, but we also were hoping we'd get some crackers. One of our dreams was to catch one of the clans. One of my dreams is to catch one of them and get me one of them hoods or faux hoods. If the head is in it, we get the head out of it and wash it, wash it, get all the blood out of it later on. But I want to hang them on my wall. I'm thinking about it. I'm working on this new uh, brownstone in Harlem in Strivers Row. And, um, if I can't have a real white man's head on my wall, since that's supposedly against white law, I'm going to find the closest reasonable facsimile that I can. You know how people hang deer on their wall and stuff? I want a white man's head 
Hang on. I'll get a painting, but I want to actually, I want to go to one of these costume shops or something. I want a white man's head hanging on my wall. Yeah, I, I can go to some of them Hollywood shops and get a head that look real. Just like the deer ain't living no more, or the lion that's on the wall ain't living no more. But I, that's what I want, a white man's head. I, live, I might have an open house when I get the house up here. Y'all can see all my African art and everything, but I got to have a white man's head hanging on my wall. My brother. So meant that for me, my speaking here tonight and speaking at the African Poetry Theater and all that, I had to pay my own way to get here, rent the car, do everything. But I haven't been home in so long, I can't go everywhere and don't do nothing at home. And everybody, Brother Ari, is on my case all the time. Brother, when are you coming back? I get those messages from him. So we need to raise some money. We have how many questions? I can't work for no devil. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it's going to be for this or that. Uh, paid over $400 just one way to get here. And then rented the car. I couldn't drive the, my car here. I just didn't have enough notice to drive. That's a long drive. I, do, I drive it back and forth frequently. So we need your assistance in raising some significant or major money. You don't, if you don't have but a dollar, give it. But we need some hundreds, some fifties, some good checks, and anything close to that. All right, sir. You can catch brother on his way up, one of them baskets. <laughs> All right, he left. He left with brother I killed back in the back. I'm just teasing you, right? That's the way the preacher do it. Brother Akil has brother's donation in the back. So what are the two questions? You set for us, brother? Okay. Sister? Well, I'll come back to you, brother. 